conversation with Hello everyone thank you for joining in today I am Priyanshu Kumar Tanathasan and today I am in conversation with Jane Pickerskill She lives and works in London. She got her undergraduate degree in fashion and she received MFA fine art in 2018 from Wimbledon College of Arts. Much of her work is concerned with social mobility and aspiration. She uses materials like organza, parcel paper, popex, thread and sculptural card constructions. Her imagery uh, evokes supermodern architecture which is employed as a metaphor for aspiration and ambition. So we welcome you Jane and first of all thank you so much for doing this for us. Let's dive thank into the session. Me. So my first question to you will be I'm quite curious like how and when this integration between fashion and fine art happened. I think for me it happened after the MA although undoubtedly I had a tutor on the MA who said to me you have a lot of skills that a normal art student would not have and maybe you should think about integrating these into your art practice at some point um it didn't particularly happen when I was on my masters uh partly because of the way the studios were set up and i didn't really see it as a place where i wanted to repeat things that i had done before i saw it as a a place where i was learning new skills learning new dialogues and um really finding a kind of voice for what i wanted to say so um the the fashion design came in not so much as an idea but as a materials idea after i finished the masters and um partly it came about because i was working from home so i had a lot of my home materials my domestic life around me and um i picked up materials that i had around me and started playing with them in terms of folding or attempting to draw on them and then realized that actually I could use the sewing machine as a drawing tool and I think that's where it re really came about and there was also the fact that when you're in your home you are kind of surrounded by some memories of things that you did in the past like as a child or you know because of your family so I was thinking about my grandmother in particular because she taught me how to sew and knit and um I took part in quite a big event in the UK which celebrated the um women be the centenary of women getting a vote so because I took part in that it occurred to me that my grandma was that generation and consequently my grandmother's skills that she taught me came into it and of course in those days they learned those skills simply to have a family you know to repair the clothes to make their clothes to look after the house um but it occurred to me that i had built on those skills in terms of forging a career as a fashion designer and why shouldn't i recontextualize them in the um you know art practice that i was making for myself so that's really how it came about <laughs> yeah so uh, uh let's talk a little bit about your studio practice your work process and some um you can just share some insights about your current project uh couture drawings um my studio i'm lucky is within just about within walking distance it gives me good exercise um but i actually chose the location of it for that reason it was more that i could get there easily and not worry about transporting myself um i share a studio and i recently well in the last 6 months got a new studio sharer it's quite important that if you share a studio it's someone who respects your work and maybe not has a similar practice but respects that for instance in my case i need to keep everything very clean i can't dirty the paper or the material because i can't wash it or anything um to make what i'm making so she's actually an illustrator and um 
an installation artist. So she works with her ideas of it, illustration for um, installation as well. Um, during the pandemic, we couldn't share a studio. We were forbidden, although we were allowed to use the studios, we had to use them on our own, which meant reduced time in the studio. But it did mean the luxury of having somewhere completely to myself. And so um, Couture Drawing actually uh, started before the pandemic, but not much before the pandemic. Uh, I have a large tables there, I have a sewing machine, I have books, um, and uh, as I said, it started with me playing around with materials that I had to hand, and then I ordered on the internet, of course, because there were no shops open, and decided that um, some of the things that I was doing uh, were kind of coming out of uh, First of all, my sewing skills from my grandma and from being a fashion designer. And secondly, they were I was making objects that were kind of aspirational or at least abstract aspirational because they represented things. For instance, I'm very interested in architecture because I wanted to be an architect when I was a teenager. But it involves a lot of science and maths and working out properties of things that I didn't feel that I was good enough at. And but the interest remains, and the uh, buildings which we're building in global cities, and I'm sure uh, Mumbai is the same, although I haven't been there. Um, but Delhi, Dubai, um, London, Paris, these huge superstructures that are mainly glass actually are simply kind of objects in a landscape, and in some respects relate to our desires to own or experience objects such as a designer dress or a designer handbag, to visit that building and go and have a drink in the rooftop bar to see the view from it. It's all part of an aspirational lifestyle. And um, so the work that was evolving uh, very much kind of was drawing connections between, say, a design address and a building um, as a kind of object of aspiration that we all feel that if we've been there or bought it or rented an experience there or something we have uh, made it in the world really you know we have um, done something amazing <laughs> well yeah um, kind of agree uh, what you said. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Jane, you have done a couple of residencies recently as well. And uh, would you like to share uh, your experiences? Well, um, the thing about residencies is that normally they take you out of your comfort zone. So, um, sometimes you have to apply to do a residency. Um, and sometimes you get invited to do one. So I've done both. Um, the, um, so I, my first residency was actually uh, on a building site at Canary Wharf. Uh, I found it very interesting because it was, as I said, going back to the, um, the kind of building site of, it was really, uh, ground zero of couture drawing because it made me look at the buildings and interrogate their qualities, the fact that they reflect things and often there's a kind of uh, mismatch between transparency and reflection. It's glass, you should be able to see through it, but in fact you get the reflection of something else instead, so you can't see through it. And um, that was for quite a long period just before I finished my master's, but it most definitely influenced the work that I did on my master's and was the seed of couture drawing my latest project. I don't think that I actually produced very much work on that, but I did do a lot of research and I realized that it kind of seeped into my brain. Um, the 
residency after that, I did a short residency at uh, studios that I was using along with someone called Couple Project Hive, which is in central London. It's a really lovely studio complex. Um, I was sharing a studio there with someone and I got invited to um, take a wall in the big art gallery that they had and use it for uh, work. So it was an opportunity to do something very different, very large, because of course, most of us don't have the opportunity to work large. We work in small studios or we work from home, from our spare room. So when you get the opportunity like that, however, scary it might seem at first it is something that you should try to embrace because it will make you do something different in your work and that moves your work on again another step so um so i did a big kind of wall art installation which was um stuck and pinned um and stapled to the wall uh, it was an abstract landscape of buildings. Um, but the thing which connected it to my fashion practice was that it was made from the card that is often used in making paper patterns for clothes. Yeah. And, um, and I destroyed it when the project finished because in fact, that's what happens in the fashion business. You, often they destroy the patterns so that no one can copy them afterwards. Or they used to, anyway. Uh, and then I took a residency, which was not at all my normal thing. I went and um, lived on a, um, a in a farmhouse, basically, which is attached to the Sydney Nellan Trust in uh, the borders of England and Wales. And Sydney Nellan is quite a famous Australian artist. He's not someone whose art I particularly like. It was more the fact that I was uh, invited to go by a group of artists who I knew and liked. And so it was a bit of a working holiday, really, because we were living in this. It was quite a basic farmhouse, by the way. It was not luxury. There was, <laughs> And we were self-catering. Um, so it was kind of just living as a group of artists for a week and discussing what we were doing each day. And I used it to make work, which was not at all my normal thing. It was um, related to how we make and mark our memories. So I was doing rubbings of textures on the ground and the building. Uh, I uh, kind of picked up and collected items from the farmyard. And ultimately, at the end of the residency in the week, I made a big wall hanging of uh, different, the, the pieces of paper or fabric were all the same size, but they were different methods of recording memories. So one person might collect things like a leaf, a flower, um, a twig or something from the ground. Someone else might make a rubbing of something on the ground. I hung that piece in the kitchen of the big manor house which the farmhouse was attached to which was Sydney Nolan's home and I hung it in the kitchen precisely because it's the, it was the starting point for another project that I'm working on which is um, honouring my grandmother and that one is also to do with um, recognising the skills she taught me and most of them were taught to me in her kitchen because she was babysitting me and my sister whilst my mum was out at work and she would be doing things like the laundry in her home so she sat us down at the kitchen and gave us pencils and paper and all sorts of things that were around the kitchen and so I hung that piece in the kitchen of the big farmhouse because it seemed an appropriate place to put it given the other project that I was working on. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, Jane, you recently, very recently uh, did uh, an installation at Deptford Does Art uh, window, and it was quite different from uh, usually <laughs> what you do in terms of your color palette. So tell us how <laughs> did you managed to uh, tackle um, this project. Like, what, what were you well, doing? actually, I did think about it in terms of what we were just talking about, which was the big hanging, because um, because of COVID, uh, the local art festival, which is called Deptford X which you can look up, it has a website. Um, 
the uh, the whole of the local area is involved. People uh, people make commissions as well as uh, so they bid for money funds, but they also just make things to occupy spaces such as empty spaces, um, shop windows, their own even home windows. So it's a real community arts festival. But because of COVID, it didn't run last year. And this year they insisted that everything had to be either in the window of a premises, or uh, if you visited it, it had to be outside or all the doors had to be open. So there was very strict um, uh, kind of technical issues. I uh, thought about making a window hanging, primarily because it was something, I wanted to work larger than I normally work. So I proposed something to a uh, coffee bar, which is in a very new building. It was my kind of ideal premises, as it were. But they didn't pick up on it because uh, I think, to be honest, the corporate owners didn't want any involvement really in the, the kind of festival. It was too much hard work for them. But a little local uh, shop come art gallery called Deptford Does Art uh, said that they would like to host an artist for the festival. So having been to the shop, I said that I would do that for them. It had quite a lot of limitations because they, uh, well, first of all, they want things inside the shop to be visible through the installation. So it either had to have cutouts or it had to be made of transparent material. So I used a net material, which I sometimes use, which is, often used for petticoats and things in uh, both costume and ballet, children's party dresses, things like that. So it's a structural material, it's quite stiff, but it's see-through. Um, and then when I talked to them, they said to me, we had a look at your website and everything on it is black and white nearly. And um, they said, is there any chance that you might incorporate some color because that way people will notice it in, more from the street. They will notice the color. So I thought, well, why not actually use colors which uh, are part of daily conversation about the pandemic. So all our governments are talking about red list, green list, amber list, travel destinations. And basically it's green means you can do this. Orange means that you can think about doing this, but very carefully, and red means you can't do it. And so I thought about using those colours for at least one of the panels. And then in actual fact, when I thought about the panels, I thought, what do these kind of represent? And I, um, I thought that the, uh, the black and white panel, which I made, represented a window or, or abstract parts of a window because for so long windows were basically the only way that we could view the world. We were stuck inside, we were told not to go outside and the window became, became the liminal space between the outside and the inside. The second panel that I made uh, related to being allowed out into parks, it was entirely this neon green color with some black uh, figures in it basically, which represented the trees and the figures. So basically being let loose and allowed to do something other than sit indoors. And the third panel was an abstract piece, um, which actually had uh, circles on it representing the traffic lights that we have on the roads. But some of them were cut out. So they were like X's for not allowed. And some of them were cut out into ticks, meaning it's allowed. And, um, and so it was a kind of abstract representation of the questions. Are we allowed to do this? No. Can I do that? No, I'm banned from doing that. It was about all the questions that were going on in our heads, basically, to do with the pandemic. It was more important to me in terms of um, taking me out of my comfort zone, actually, not doing something that I do have done before, really. So the colour was one thing and the size was something else. It was actually the biggest piece I've produced in three panels. Um, and I'll probably, to be honest, show it again at my open studios in my studio window or on the wall or something like that. But 
it's um, because it was created for a specific space to fit a window. It's something that is quite hard to move around and show somewhere else unless you've got a big space. But people were shocked that I'd used such bright colours. <laughs> I did get quite a lot of Instagram followers from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it, it makes sense because obviously everything is so dull and, you know, when you see these yeah. colours, you feel happy. I mean, I feel happy when I see colours. It is something, actually, that I think now I'm possibly ready to start using colour again, but I will think very carefully about it because colour has a very um, evocative meaning, I think, to a lot of people. And, you know, what does this... I think when you start using colour... Um, unless you're just making represent, representative or you know, kind of visually represented art, so it's kind of you know, representational paintings. Yeah. In abstract art, colours often have a meaning or an, a, an extra meaning that I think you have to think about. So I will definitely have to think about why I'm using that colour now, not just the material. Upcoming projects or any exhibitions if you have in mind? Um, I've just uh, I've just got a piece in a quite a prestigious competition exhibition here, which is the Society of Women Artists. Yeah. But this year it's online again. Um, normally they're showing the Mal Galleries, which is uh, in the centre of London. Um, so um, that's uh, it's actually one of the pieces that I just showed in another exhibition. It's funny that people would choose the same piece. Uh, in terms of my uh, personal projects, I um, I mean, we've always always got applications on the go for all sorts of things. Um, but I suppose I have now have two kind of ways that I can go. First of all, I've worked, I've just worked big for that last commission. So I'm intending thinking about working on a much larger, and I've got, I've got a piece in work at the moment, which is about half the size of one of these panels. Um, so one of my projects or my ambitions is to work on a larger piece. And the next one, I'm going to start gradually uh, working with color but I may not do it as a colour symphony, as it were, so that it's lots of colours. It might literally be swapping where I normally use black and white. I might, for instance, use black with something else. So because my main interest is in form and line, I don't want the colour to get in the way of that. I want it to be a, a kind of accessory to it. Um, so those are my kind of upcoming projects for work. So the next piece of work will probably be one of the coloured pieces and I've yet to decide what colour it is. Yeah. And lastly, do you have any advice uh, based on your experience for the upcoming or emerging artists? Um, I, um, I mean, I come from a, a different place to a lot of, uh, emerging artists in that I'm much older so I had a first career and this is really my second career um, and my advice to someone who is in a similar situation is don't actually forget what you have done before uh, because it might prove a valuable component of your work because it makes you unique you know my experience in the fashion business um, lends uh, a uniqueness to my approach to making art now. I mean, all of my work isn't textiles, but a good proportion of it is. And in fact, uh, I think it might be becoming what I'm recognized for. Um, so I think it was Oscar, Oscar Wilde had a very famous saying, which was something like, um, be yourself because everyone else is taken. <laughs> so I think you need to think very carefully not to Apart from incorporating some things from uh, your, maybe from your own personal experience, uh, whether or not it's a quite long experience like mine of the fashion business or a shorter experience of something you've done. Try not to fall into the trap of thinking this is what people want to buy, because what they want is something unique, really. Most people want to buy something that is unique. Um, 
and they literally appreciate what it is that is unique about your work. So try not to think in terms of if I do this, it will sell. That person is making that. So if I make that, I'll sell too. Otherwise, you're just basically making a product. You're not making art. You're copying what other people are doing. That would be my advice, uh, I think. And never af be afraid, really, to be different, um, to think about what you do that is different and uh, think of that as a talent, not something to be ashamed about. Yeah, preach. Yeah, so thank you so much, Jane, uh, for doing this for us. It was a lovely session and it was lovely to have you with us.